Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker. And today I have the incredible privilege of speaking to a man who was for 40, almost 40 years, an evangelical pastor and church leader. But he decided one day that his beliefs no longer squared with the beliefs of his church and he left and ultimately became an atheist. But to further complicate things and complicate is putting it mildly, uh, my guest uh, has learned that in, within the last uh, 11 months that he has a fatal illness. But rather than feeling sorry for himself, he has a message that he wants to bring. Dave Warnock, it's an absolute honor to have you on the channel. Thank you, Lloyd. Good to be here. My pleasure. So... Gosh, where to begin? Where um, to start, right? <laughs> I heard about your story. I think you appeared on The Atheist Experience not long before I did. And mm -hmm. when I was researching, because I, I obviously already knew quite a lot about the show and I was a fan of the show, but just to bring myself up to speed, I, I watched a bit of your uh, comments at uh, the ACA and found your story intriguing. Um, tell us about dying out loud and what that means well dying out loud is a phrase that we kind of just um adopted it just kind of dropped into our lap uh the the people that uh, marie who i think you met is my manager and assistant and she began to book me on podcasts and speaking gigs around the country that was Last year, uh, spring, uh, spring of last year, I got the diagnosis in February of last year. And so we started looking for ways to talk about things that were important for me. And, and, and what that was, was looking at death as an atheist and therefore looking at life as an atheist, contrasted to my former view as a Christian, evangelical Christian, wherein this life was um, secondary to eternal life. And so viewing this life as the only one we have affects how we live this life. And so that's what I wanted to talk about. Instead mm. of just curling up in a fetal position and dying, I, saw, I thought, what, what can I do with whatever time I have left to talk about these important subjects that people began to find very interesting? And I started getting a lot of positive feedback. And so we just kept kind of rolling with it. And the dying out loud phrase just kind of uh, became something that was the, the way to title it. Um, so that's that's kind of how it started, and then it, it just kind of evolved from there to where it became kind of a thing. And and you know we're traveling all over the place, and we have T-shirts and um, <laughs> yeah. merch and all the stuff. So yeah, that's dying out loud. If if I can just let the viewers know, um, it, it's uh, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, I understand from reading the bio on your website, I'll, put, I'll drop a link in the description, okay. that the diagnosis you were given was, was three to five years. Right. Um, one of the most uh, common expressions you often hear said about atheists by believers is there are no atheists in foxholes. There's this yeah. understanding that when push comes to shove and it's time to, to pass on, all of a sudden... Uh, an atheist will rekindle a latent spirituality. Uh, you're here to say that that's not true with you. Yeah, well, I got the, when I got the diagnosis, I'd been an atheist. Uh, I let go of my faith back in 2010 or 11. Mm. So, you know, a good eight or nine years. So after I got the diagnosis, I did send an email to God and just tell him I was just kidding about I didn't even know he thing. had an email address. That's <laughs> fascinating. Wow. It's, it's god at gmail.com. Okay. Um, got it. Yeah. And I sent an email just telling him I was kidding about the atheist thing and hey, you know, can we be friends again? And I haven't gotten a response yet. So I, <laughs> I'm going to assume that I'm on my own. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the whole atheist in Fox House, that's rather insulting, isn't it? When yeah. you think about it, it's rather insulting to think that uh, if we do get faced in with life-threatening things um that we're going to run back to a sky daddy that we professed we didn't believe in but now we're all of a sudden going to believe in him because we're facing death that just doesn't make any sense on any level in my mm. opinion and and you know without wanting to you know 
without wanting the conversation to be too morbid, I, I understand this is obviously something that you've you'll have spent a lot of time thinking about. But it, it's just fascinating to be speaking to somebody who for whom the clock I mean the clock's ticking for all of us, but for whom the clock is is ticking a little bit more imminently. Um what's it like you know, being forced to reconcile with with such uh, an impending death in the way that you've been forced to? It's a mixed bag, honestly. Uh, I like the clock ticking. Uh, when you were saying that, I was thinking, yeah, we, we've all got a clock ticking. For most of us, it's in our head somewhere, and it's like mine has been set out on the table. Right. And there's a there's a, a, a number there that I know, oh, my God, when that gets to that number, it's like a countdown, you know. Um, so mine's a little more, um, ever present and visible and, uh, you know, ominous if you will, but, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag because the, on the one hand it's sobering and it, and it's something that is, um, you know, it's something that you don't ever, your mind doesn't ever get very far away from. It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of, especially with a, something like ALS where I feel it in my body, right. uh, I see the deterioration of my muscles and, and so every, every day when I do things, I'm aware of it. it. I'm reminded, you know, I can't make a fist with my left hand and I get tired when I'm dry myself off after a shower. And so every single day, it's not, you know, it's there in front of me and I can't, I can't get out of my body. Mm. Um, but on the, on the other hand, it's allowed me this opportunity to focus in a way on life that many of us don't get. And it's allowed me, it's given me this platform to talk with people like you and other people around the world and uh, to talk about things that matter and to talk about things that help people in real life. I feel like I'm helping people in ways that are much more significant than I ever did as a pastor mm. uh, because it's really helping them cope with the life they're living right now. And, and I did some of that as a pastor. It wasn't always about pie in the sky. It was about helping real people with real issues, but I'm doing that now as an atheist and, and people are are genuinely it, it affects the way they view their life and if i can help another person get through life a little better get through it make someone's day a little better that's that's a big thing in my book hmm. so I mean, the als has given me that that opportunity to do so and so for that i'm thankful so it's a really weird paradigm honestly it's a fantastic attitude that you have there i mean my personal opinion is that it would be difficult to imagine a world so dominated by religion if everybody was comfortable with their mortality. Right. I mean, to a large extent, religion sort of monopolizes on the human fear of death and oh, offers yeah. a, a solution, a product, which is to say, well, you don't have to worry about it because, you know, just believe what we're telling you that if you do what we say, you're going to, survive your own death in some way shape or form and to meet somebody who for who has truly mastered that fear of death i know it, i know you'll probably have your bad days as well as your good days but it's mm -hmm. extremely refreshing to see a living embodiment of someone for whom the fear of death has no has no grip well thank you i i, I do think that for some reason um I, back to the the mortal element that mm. Christians they bought into this. Um, we I I used to be included in that group, bought into the notion that we're immortal, that that death is just a little detour, a little stopping off place, you know, like we're just going to the bathroom and now we're gonna you know live in heaven forever. And so the the reality of death never really lodges in our brain, and and for that reason. You know, the Bible even talks about that death is the last enemy that shall be destroyed. And the Bible says that the fear of death keeps people in bondage for their whole life. Well, yeah, it can be a bondage if you give in to fear of death. But if you just look at it as the result of living, uh, like uh, any, anything in life, it, uh, waking up is the result of going to sleep. And going to sleep at the end of the day is, is the result of being awake all day. It's mm -hmm. just this cycle that that life entails and so i think that christians have developed a great fear of death because it forces them to face their own mortality if my in my opinion if christians really believed that eternal life was real 
and that this life was just a stop, just a, a brief entrance into the eternal life, they'd be anxious to die. You know, they wouldn't be afraid of it. They'd feel, oh my God, bring it on. Let's go. I can't wait to hang with Jesus. But the fact that they're so afraid of it and, and so much in denial of it maybe makes me think they're not, they're not quite bought into the whole concept as much as they'd like to think they are. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's huge complexity to the human mind, isn't there? And yeah. um, I've Layers. spoken on my channel before about cognitive dissonance and how that yeah. works and how, in, in fact, it's almost a survival uh, need for us to be able to balance two competing ideas in our heads at the same time because um, there needs to be this, this friction or this discomfort when we're confronted with something that, that doesn't make sense. Because right. otherwise, we'd accept more or less anything. <laughs> People would just be able to walk up to us and say, "Oh, that that whole thing that you believed, well, something entirely different is true. We just believe them." There has to be yeah. some kind of discomfort in order for us to preserve our sense of self. Mm -hmm. So, cognitive dissonance, in, in a way, is is the body's or the mind's way of preserving self, which yeah. kind of makes sense. But it also creates, as you say, this paradox where you know people can be both afraid and terrified of death and also under the illusion that actually death is just like you say a waypoint yeah and i think lo looking at it as a, as a secular person i think gives us uh more of an open-mindedness about it and and we shouldn't i mean i, I have talked to, and i've obviously talked about death a lot and i hear from a lot of people and and i do know a lot of people even in the secular community still have a fear of death uh that said almost every time I've talked to them and I've had conversations, I had a conversation on the, on the phone just this week with somebody who was expressing, you know, their paralysis almost uh, over the fear of death. Mm. And almost invariably it's because they had as a young, as a young person, as a young child, they had these notions of death and hell drilled into their heads in such a way that they're traumatized by it still as adults thinking, waking up in the middle of the night thinking they're burning in hell, um, afraid to go to sleep at night. Um, it's, it causes real trauma in people. And uh, I, I'm going to, I'm speaking at a conference on religious trauma in Vancouver in the spring, and I'm really excited about it because this is a subject that's just now being explored in real ways by real therapists and psychologists who understand that real trauma has been inflicted upon people from religious ideas that are imprinted on them as young people and even as adults. And so uh, this, this death notion that we're afraid of confronting, looking mm. at it just open faced and saying, okay, this is what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, are you afraid of death? And I'm really not, I'm just afraid of not living. And so my focus is on what we have in front of us. What can I do about the life I have in front of me? And when I get to that curtain, that I go through on that final day, I won't, there, there's nothing to be afraid of on the other side of it because I won't be aware of anything on the other side of it. I won't wake up. I won't be aware that I'm not alive. I won't be aware that, oh, now I'm missing people or I'm missing things or they're having a party and I'm not invited. And, you know, I'm not over there looking through a one-way glass at life going on. It, that's not how this works. Hmm. So, you know, the lights go out and that's it. That's my view on it. I may be wrong. I don't know what's on the other side. It really doesn't matter. If I spend too much time worrying about it, then I'm going to miss what's on this side. Yeah. My, my attitude is similar to that of, I saw an interview with, uh, um, not an interview. It was a panel and Christopher Hitchens was on this panel and it was after he'd had his diagnosis yeah. and, uh, he, he answered the question or he, he, he just expressed that, when it comes to death and the possibility of an afterlife, his view was, well, I like surprises, you know, <laughs> yeah. who, know who knows? I might be surprised, but yeah. this is what I'm expecting, you know? So yeah, I'm really glad that you're highlighting the trauma aspect of fundamentalist uh, religions because with Jehovah's witnesses, um, they don't, they reject the hell teaching. Yeah, uh, they argue that a, a god of love wouldn't punish people in this way, and actually, um, whenever it refers to lakes of burning fire, all it's doing is symbolizing eternal destruction. Uh, their real kind of fear mongering comes in with the whole Armageddon ideology. So, 
again, the clock's ticking, the world's going to be destroyed any minute. And if you're not in the right club, there's a fireball with your name on it. So <laughs> hell has just been replaced with rather than eternal destruction, you could say a violent destruction yeah. or the withholding of a whole bunch of promises that everyone else will get but you. And that is enough to give people trauma to the extent that you could be disfellowshipped as a Jehovah's Witness and spend years or decades still thinking that Armageddon's coming and you're going to die. Yeah. Um, and only to stumble on a video or a, or a blog article or a resource that, that finally convinces you that it was all a load of nonsense. Yeah, and that's horrible. That's a horrible way to live life. And, and even though your conscious mind is aware that this is all rubbish, you know, this is, this is bunk, that, that can't be true. It's not true. There's, there's no afterworld. There's, this is not a fucking disaster movie that, you know, we're going to, yeah, get hit with a, a comet, you know. Mm. It, I mean, that's more likely to happen than, than some kind of weird afterlife. But, yeah, the fact that our minds can know that and yet our, our, our emotional self can still be traumatized uh, at night in dreams uh, during the day triggered by something someone says or something you see that's just horrible and and when you're indoctrinated as a little child that's nothing short of child abuse in my opinion hmm. what can you tell us about you know what brought you to evangelical uh, christianity to begin with was it child indoctrination mine wasn't um i'm, I'm actually writing a book and so this is all really fresh because sure. i've been working through some of these these chapters on my early conversion experience. And I was a young man of 18 right out of high school. And what I'm, what I'm looking at, because I never really have analyzed it a lot. I've just kind of gone with it as most people do when they get caught up in some religious ideology, they just kind of go with whatever is presented to them. Very few of us lay out a, a, a chart of all the religions of the world and analyze them carefully and make the most reasonable decision. We don't do that. I mean, if we did, we'd probably say, oh, I think all of them are pretty ridiculous. But we just kind of go with what's presented to us in whatever environment we grow up in. And that was my case. So I was a young man, very vulnerable, very um, insecure, unsure of my future. And so when presented with this Christian ideology, this, this Christianity, this Jesus, I said, yeah, that looks pretty good. He's got all the answers. Here's the book. Here's the people you hang out with. Here's what you go, what you do. Here's where you go. Here's how you talk. It's just a plug and play system. So for me uh, at that age and being in a vulnerable position, it was, I mean, I was just prime bait for that. And so I got sucked up in it. And then once you get in it, uh, you know, you get, I got married, started having a family and just kind of going down through the years you just you're in that world and you stay in that world because everyone else that you know is in that world and you never get presented with a competing idea and so you never have to stop and say wait a minute i wonder if that's a better thing because everything that comes across your table that's different is wrong it's just wrong if it's different than what we're doing they're wrong and we're right because why not if 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 it was, if what we were doing wasn't right, we'd, we'd do it, we'd do the right thing, but because it's what we're doing, it must be right. I mean, that's, I, I look back at that. And I go, oh my God, how did I never pause and think this through? But I never did. Hmm. How do you become a pastor? This is a question that intrigues me because I could tell anyone how they, how someone becomes an elder or a ministerial servant in the Jehovah's Witness religion, but I've never really heard anyone explain how you go from simply attending church, you mentioned joining yeah. at 18, to a tap on the shoulder, do you fancy being a pastor? I, I don't know how it works. <laughs> That's kind of how it works for me. Um, right. There are several channels in the U.S. Depends on what brand you you buy into. You know, there are different, so many different denominations, and a lot of them have different uh, um, parameters for how they do ministry and how they do their clergy. But in my world, we were just independent, charismatic, fundamentalist churches. So, all you needed in that tribe was a call from God and the anointing. And so, because I have a, a vivacious personality, I'm a talker, I'm a people person, 
I think it was attached to me that you must be a pastor because you've got these personality, these gifts. So a lot of that terminology, you have the gift of leadership. You have the gift of pastoral ministry. You have God's, God's calling is on you. So you'd have people in your life telling you, you know, I see a, I see a calling uh, of a pastor. You're a pastor. You're, you know, prophetic words. So in that world, that's really all you needed. That's the only credentials you needed. And then the body of people that you're with will ordain you and you get licensed by the state. And so you're off and running. So over my years in that world, I had different times and seasons where I would be on staff as a pastor at other times I had moved or for whatever reason I wasn't. And I was just doing my own work or had a job or a business that I ran. So my career wasn't this level uh, thing that a lot of, a lot of people go to seminary and they graduate from seminary. They get a theology degree or some kind of Bible degree, depending on whatever group you're with. And then you, you move into ministry that way. So there's different ways depending on which tribe you're in, but mine was, what I just described. Okay. And do you have any pleasant memories from your nearly 40 years as a pastor? Yeah, I really do. I, I enjoyed pastoral ministry. I loved the work. I was always grateful for when I could be paid on staff to do what I love doing anyway, because most of the time, even if I wasn't on staff somewhere, I was in leadership. I was leading men's ministries or small groups or teaching classes or whatever, even as a volunteer. So I was always very active and involved and felt, I felt God's call on my life. I felt like it was real. There were times in my life when I was dis what I would call disobedient to the call and, you know, did my prodigal son thing. And I certainly wasn't, I didn't make good choices all the time. I had issues with uh, authority and obedience and things. So I was always a little bit of a rebellious son, um, but I always felt like God was calling me and anointing me and gifting me. And so I did enjoy the work of the ministry. I, I enjoyed ministering to people, counseling them, teaching classes. I enjoyed preaching. Um, all those things I felt like at the, I felt like I was doing what God wanted me to do. And I felt like it was beneficial to the people that I served. I was very serious about it. I never, a lot of people view pastors as charlatans and, you know, they're just snake oil salesmen. They know it's, they know it's a game, but they love playing it and they make good money at it. That's a very small percentage in my view, of people who are pastors. I think most of us were in it for the right reasons. Misguided, yes, but still with the right motivations. Was there anything about your time as a pastor and, and your role as a pastor that you look back on with regret? All those years I did it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I again, I, a regret is something, It's I think regret is a really costly emotion um mm. so i don't i don't tend to let it dwell there much i love you that did maya the best Angel with the hand you were dealt exactly and i was about to say something to that effect the maya yeah. angelou quote that i love and i've made reference to several times is this do the best you can until you know better and then when you know better do better right. and that's that describes my life perfectly sure. um so i i regret uh getting into it with so little a analytical perspective from my point i never examined it i never analyzed it i just accepted it whole cloth and whenever the doubts and the questions would come along i may have given vent to them a bit but i would always shove them aside and squash them down and just plunge ahead because i believed i was on the right path i regret not being more skeptical and not being more open-minded and asking the right questions because i think i would have gotten out a lot sooner than I did, because once I did start examining it, it, it came up short pretty quickly. You did uh, mention uh, that when you, one of the things that re really kept you going was in a way that you were heavily invested. I mean, right. your whole family was also involved um, in your faith. Talk us through uh, the, the crisis of, of faith that you had and what effect that had on on you emotionally and on your family yeah the the we raised we had three kids and we raised them in the faith and you know that when you're in that world you're you're immersed in it completely your kids are in youth groups and children's church and women's ministry and men's ministry it just kind of 
it just kind of consumes your whole life, the, at least the way we were. We were not casual church attenders. We were very involved in all the aspects of it because we felt like that's what God wanted. And so we were happy to do it. So because of that, um, I, I, my kids were raised with the idea that this is how life is. This is how you do life. You, it's a serious thing. This following God is a serious thing. And so um, evidently we were successful in, in, in putting that in their minds. And so the last, what, what started me, my search for truth, if you will, or uh, my questioning on a real serious level was, was in fact related to my children. And, and the last church I was on staff at, uh, this was back in 2008, 2009, I was on staff. And the pastor and I just didn't get along and he was very controlling and I was too independent. And so it came to an ending, a parting of that. And they let me go from that position. And I was happy to go because it wasn't working out. I was at the point where I was either going to quit or get fired. And I thought, well, if they fire me, they'll have to pay me some severance. So I'll go that route. Um, but my daughters, uh, I have two adult daughters and an adult son. They're all married and have families. Um, and the girls are married to men who were at the time on staff, not on staff, but they were in a student intern program being groomed to be pastors within this mega church. And, and so the, the lead pastor essentially long story short turned my kids against me in, mm. in ways that only religion indoctrination can do. Uh, very cultish. If, you know, I know you've experienced that with JWs, mm. but uh, essentially they, they shunned my wife and I for, almost a year. Um, I mean, truly shunning. If you saw them in a store, they would turn away, that kind of thing. All because I was independent and was in, in rebellion against God's authority, as they said. I wasn't, I still at that time was a Christian. I mean, I mm. still hadn't, I had not evacuated. They were shunning you as a believer. As a believer, right. because I was, I was rebelling against God's authority and causing division in the house and, you know, all the sin against the house and all the things that, terminology that people who would never been there kind of cringe at because it's mm. cringe worthy. Uh, but anyway, that, that initiated in me the questioning finally of saying, okay, I am just doing everything I can for you, God. I can't get any resolution here. I can't get no satisfaction, God. Um, so what's up? Where are you? Uh, and that I, I started, I started finally saying, wait a minute, what's going on here? You know? And so I just, my examination was very uh, pure, if you will. I didn't go read a bunch of atheist books. I avoided them for that reason. I wanted to search it out on my own. I didn't want Hitchens or Dawkins or somebody telling me what to think. I was going to do my own thinking and my own investigation, and I did it with the Bible. And when I, when I did that from a skeptical viewpoint, not from a, an apologetic viewpoint, it, it quickly became very evident to me that the Bible was nothing more than a man-made document. Mm. Em emphasis on man, by the way, not woman. Mm. And, and it wasn't God-inspired. It wasn't the inerrant word of God. It was just a bunch of men saying a bunch of things about God and about how to control people. And when I saw that the Bible was not what I thought it was, then I let go of everything else pretty quickly. So that was my process. And what, what effects did that have? I mean, you've already told us that you were shunned as a believer. Yeah, yeah. I'm How imagining... much worse could it get, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the sad part of that is they had begun to come around because I did, I tried to repent of my independence and wrote letters and tried to smooth things over. And that happened over a course of about a year. But, but during that time, I was also doing my investigation. So about the time they were coming around a little bit, it's about the time I was saying, oh, shit, I don't believe any of this anymore. And now I've got to tell them that. Mm. And so it just kicked it back to where it was. And they, they basically adopted a position that uh, their dad was in rebellion against God and needed to repent. And they couldn't. I think their position is pretty much that if they embrace me as, a, as an atheist and try to have a relationship with me that's normal, what normal families do all over the world, they're going to be endorsing my sin and they can't endorse my sin. They have to keep me at arm's length so that I'll feel the weight of my sin and return to God. That's the primary motivation behind shunning. They feel the weight of their sin by the loss of relationship. And I can't tell, I've tried to tell them that 
that I can't repent of something. I can't return to a God I don't think is there. I, you're asking me to do something that's impossible. So once I let the kids know that, and my friends and everyone know that I no longer believed and did not identify as a Christian, then it kind of went back to where it was before. It's more of a broken relationship now than a shunning. Hmm. And my, my son wasn't involved. He, he's in a different place with me. He and I are in good terms because he wasn't in that church. He was away at college when all this happened. So he didn't bear the brunt of it like the girls did. So, so w- with your daughters, it would be safe to say that, you know, the lines of communication are open again. It's just not anything like how it perhaps should be. No. Yeah. It's, it's like hmm. one of them doesn't take my phone calls. The other one, if I called, which would probably call me back in a week or two, maybe mm. not mm. emails, you know, there's a little bit of this, but I don't push for the relationship anymore simply because for so many years I did. Mm. Um, and it affected me in such a negative way that I had to, I had to let it go. Mm. I had to come to terms with it. And so after my deconversion and letting Christianity go, I stayed married for another four or five years. Uh, my wife was not seeing the kids. We have six grandkids and they were not allowed to come to our home. The, the girls were not seeing my wife either. She was bearing, and she stayed a believer. She still is. Hmm. And she was bearing the weight of my sin, if you will. So all of that really took a toll on us. It took a toll on our marriage, which it didn't survive. I left that about three years ago. Hmm. And, and I was living a life that was very sad. And I was letting this broken relationship, this broken family kind of dictate the terms of my life. It was writing my story for me. Hmm. And after four or five years of that, I just couldn't take it anymore. And, and I said, I've, I've got to make a change. If I, if I don't like the way my life's going, I'm the one that has to change it. And that's the conclusion I came to about three years ago. And that's long before I got the ALS diagnosis. So this was a a reboot of life that happened before ALS. I just, I just said, no, I'm not living this life like this anymore. I'm not going to get up every day all sad and depressed. I have to let my girls go. It's kind of like a death, if you will. Mm. You know, you, you have to let it go or it'll consume you. And it was consuming me. I mean, ostracism is such an unnatural, um, counterintuitive thing yeah. when especially when we're dealing with relationships with relationships with, between parents and children i i'm just struggling to understand how things can still be bad even post diagnosis because it's one thing yeah. to shun someone who you think's going to be around for the next few decades and another thing to shun them when they've not got very long left that's it's sad um it's it's hard I'm not angry with them because I understand where they're coming from. But when other people hear about it, when my girlfriend hears about it, she just has a hard time not being angry at them Hmm. because even post ALS, they have not made efforts to come around and see, and see me. And I just don't, I think it's just because they just don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with me. They don't know what to do with this. How does God factor into this? What is God saying about, the ALS, the atheism, their dad. It's such a mixed bag of emotions that I think when, when it comes down to it, I think it's just safer for them emotionally to keep a distance. They, they, they would get, it would cost too much for them emotionally to try to be involved in my life with all of that stuff swirling around. Mm. That's, that's the conclusion that I've come to. You have a calendar of various speaking events. You've been kind enough to squeeze me in for this interview. Um, and I noticed as well, you're going to be doing a, a European tour, I think in June. Um, so you're really kind of stacking up the, the dates. Um, to what extent do you feel comfortable planning forward um, when you have the ticking clock? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And it's interesting that I've really, I, I like next in a couple of weeks, uh, I've got a, we've, we've rented a, we've a reserved a, a beach house or a place where I used to vacation all the time. It's in the Gulf coast of Florida and I, it's a special place for me. And I booked that thing like nine months ago. And I remember when I booked it last spring, I remember thinking it's coming up midweek and mid February. 
and a bunch of my friends are going to gather there. We're just going to have a good relaxing vacation time. And I remember when I booked it, I thought, wow, I don't know if I should do this uh, almost a year away. I don't know what kind of shape I'll be in. I could be in a wheelchair. I could be on a stretcher. Who knows? But you know what? I'm just going to do it. If I have to cancel it, I'll cancel it. But, and then I was talking about that at a, at a meeting the other day. And I just said this, I said, and it came out of my mouth and I stopped and said, Oh damn, that's good. I need to write that down. <laughs> and it, and it, and it's simply this, the minute we quit planning, we start dying. And so I realize that now. And if I don't plan ahead, like anybody would in life, then I'm going to give into this thing and it's going to start eating me and, and getting to me. So I'm going to keep planning. Um, we've got dates booked into July. I've got stuff set up for September next year. Um, I'm just going to go. And they may be, you know, I've seen people get onto planes with wheelchairs. I can do it. Um, so I'm just going to keep planning ahead as long as people want, want to have me in and talk and, I'm physically able to do it. It is taxing physically. I won't lie. It's easier just to stay where you know everything's in place and you've got your routine and, you know, just little things that you do every day that you don't think about become more difficult if you're in a strange place and you don't know how, if it's going to be okay. How do I turn the shower on, for instance? You know, I need help turning a shower on now. Well, that's a bummer. Hmm. But it's worth it to me to get out there and see the people and talk to them and, and hug the necks and have the conversations. That's what makes life just so, so precious to me. So yeah, I'm planning ahead, man. I'm, I'm not going to slow down until I just have to. <laughs> That's absolutely fascinating because you're in what many would consider to be a very thankfully unique situation. I mean, most people it's safe to say would not like to be in your shoes and they're grateful that it's not a, not a common thing. Yeah. Um, but, and yet the message that you have, and I know another one of your slogans is <laughs> carpe the fucking diem. <laughs> Sorry viewers. I, I virtually never swear on this channel, um, but that's one of your slogans, isn't it? And I think yeah. what you've just said there, when you said, you know, the minute you stop planning is when you start dying that's a universal message that everyone can learn. From. Every one of us can live by whether you have a fatal disease or not. It's just live your best life. Uh, grab the moments. Um, seize the day is what that carpe diem means, obviously. And we just put the effing in there just to, give it, <laughs> to give it a punch, right? <laughs> to make me lose half my subscribers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it adds it, it's an added emphasis mm. that I think gives it a little more punch like i yeah. said because then you go wow yeah get after it man mm. don't let this life pass you by what am i doing with the days i've been given and if i'm not doing what i want why not who's going to make that different if i don't hmm. if in the future uh your daughters or your maybe your grandchildren uh stumble on this video what would be your message to them Oh, dude, you're going to make me cry, aren't you? <laughs> I, you know, all I want my, all I want anyone to know is that I did the best I could. I, I did. I really have. I've, I've, I'm a flawed person. I've made many mistakes. I've stumbled and I've fallen and I've always gotten up and I've just, all I, all I can do is do the best I can do. And that's what I'm doing. And I know that, you know, I know that some of my family, I've got like my mom and brother and some others who are evangelical Christians. And I know some of them look onto my stuff and they see what I'm doing and, and they know that I'm opposing evangelical Christianity and that's their life. That's what they're doing. I have a brother who's an evangelical pastor and you know, we're, we're, we're totally at odds in, in our worldview and our message for life and for living it's polar opposites. So he's doing his passionate best. And I'm doing my passion at best. I have one of my daughters and her husband down in Florida just planted a church last year. I mean, they're full on. They're, they're balls deep in this thing. Oh, that didn't go well. I shouldn't have said that. They are all in. And so am I. Mm. And I'm passionate about what I believe and why I believe it. And I respect anyone who does anything with passion. As long as you're honest and respectful 
and open-minded. That's the key to me. I mean, any Christian anywhere, any day can come to me and have an open and honest discussion with me and ask me any question and we'll have an, a reasonable conversation as long as we're both open-minded and respectful. Now, when you come at me with your certainty and with your dogma, we're probably not going to talk very long. And that's just how I am. I'm, I'm, I'm here for anyone who wants to have a conversation. Keep that in mind, dear Christian. I've been on your side of the street for many, many years. I may know more about it than you do. So, you know, just bear that in mind if you're going to come at we, me with this, hey, I've got something you haven't thought of, Dave. You know, <laughs> no, I probably have. <laughs> But no, to my daughters, my grandchildren, I hope they see these one day. I, like I said, and I, I don't rail against them. I'm not angry at them. I feel, I feel like they've been caught up in a system that is very damaging. I was caught up in it for many years. So I can never find fault with people who are caught up in it. I know how it can happen. I've seen it happen. It happened with me. I feel like I got free from it. And I want to warn other people that there's, there's toxic danger in that system and it hurts people. And I believe that and I'm passionate about that. And if my daughters disagree with that, at least they should be able to recognize that I'm being honest and authentic with what I'm doing. And that's all I can do. Well, you certainly are being honest and authentic and contributing a great deal. I feel like I've learned from our uh, conversation and even if they're not proud of you now or never will be proud of you, they certainly should be proud of you. Thank um, you. So thank you so much for, for sharing. Just one final message. If there's anybody watching this who feels as though they, they're trapped in a belief system or they have doubts, but they don't know, they don't feel safe confronting those doubts, uh, what would your message be to them? Well, everyone has doubts, I do believe. Um, it takes a lot of courage to be honest with your doubts. And, and I, um, I, I sent this out on Twitter last week, uh, and it was interesting, the response I got. It kind of blew up, uh, in fact. I don't know if you saw it, but I just said simply something like, um, to change your mind about long-held beliefs takes courage. You have to admit you're wrong about something. And to admit you're wrong takes courage. And if you've deconstructed your faith, you are courageous. Repeat as needed. And I sent that out and it got retweeted and liked and all, it just kind of blew up. And, and I thought, what is it about that that so captured people's attention? And I think it's simply this, the, the courage part of it. Because it does. If you're if you're caught in something and you've got one foot in and one foot out and you're tormented, just address it honestly and, and be courageous enough to be honest with yourself. I think that's the point. Wonderful. Wise words. And, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and you'll have more wise words, hopefully, in your forthcoming book. Having written the book, I know how arduous it is, uh, oh, that whole God. process. So It's killing yeah. me, man. It's killing me. <laughs> Oh, well, you've got enough of that problem at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, but dare I ask what date you're aiming for? Well, I've really been, um, I've really been, uh, I've got a full scale. I mean, I work at it at this desk every day and, and I really do make my, the, the key to writing is anyone who's written, as you know, is to make yourself do the work. You can't mm. sit around waiting for inspiration. You have to just put the work in. Hmm. So I've really been doing that. I'm probably about 35% done as far as the content. So I really have to get it done by this year, uh, hopefully before the end of the year, but definitely by the end of this year. Hmm. And um, if I really put the hammer down, I think I can have it done by, by sometime this summer. Excellent. Well, I will put your website and social media links in yes. the description so people can uh, follow you and uh, catch up with you hopefully maybe on one of your tours but uh, Dave Warnock it's been an absolute honor speaking to you I so admire what you're doing and I I'm very grateful to you for spending the time talking to me thank you so much for having me it's been a blast you're a good guy thank you so viewers I hope you've enjoyed this conversation I'm blown away by it uh, don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos and as always thank you for watching